morning. Today, we are hoping for a miracle. Okay, maybe not a miracle. That's a tad bit dramatic. It is far too early in the season to be asking for one of those. Not to mention there's much more important things in life than needing a miracle on the farm. I'm sure there's all sorts of people who could use a miracle more than us. Basically, this storm system moving across Illinois right now determines whether or not we get to plant this week, especially if there's a large amount of rainfall with it. I guess at the bare minimum, I could use a little good luck because there is a small possibility that that slides by to the north as it keeps heading northeast. It definitely looks like it's going to rain today though. It's just kind of that type of day outside, so not holding my breath, and the forecast is giving us a 90% chance of rain. This pretty much sums up 90% of farming. Is it or is it not going to rain? Because that's the basis of a lot of our field work, whether or not the ground is too wet. And on rare occasion, whether or not the ground is too dry. That's typically not an issue we deal with here in central Illinois. Anyways, just on my way to work and conveniently placed in between my house and the farm is our John Deere dealership where the Hagee still sits untouched and unmoved. They've also not worked on this other one. I'm not sure which one's first in the quo. Hopefully mine, because if we do miss this rain, I'm gonna need that sprayer relatively quickly. Maybe if we just accept the fact that it is 100% going to rain, it won't rain reverse psychology. The sprinkles on my windshield and the cloud formation in the background indicate to me that my wishes have fallen on deaf ears. Oh man, there's always next week I guess. You know, given the destruction we've seen over the last week from very strong storms producing tornadoes and the potential for this system moving across Illinois mid-morning here, let's just hope and pray that rain is all we get. Storms are brewing first round was only an appetizer for the next storm coming through. That's a used one, isn't it? That's what you need. Well, that's got the rotating connection on it, too. What does that do for you? It oscillates however you want. That's what we need on the backhoe. It's awfully early, but my dad's getting one? his Christmas shopping in. I wanted to take a very quick minute to thank the sponsor of today's video, Discount Lots. Discount Lots is a convenient, simple, and straightforward way for individuals located within the United States to find their dream property. And it's literally as simple as this. You go to discountlots.com where you can easily navigate through their vast selection of land. Many of these properties aren't even available on the open market. You sift through the offerings to locate the ones that you like based on price and location. Lastly, you hit buy now. Individuals also have the option to make use of financing through discount lots, which simplifies the process even more. Did I mention that there are no extra fees or credit checks? Yeah, it's that straightforward. The best part is that the discount lots team handles every step in the process, eliminating any unnecessary fees. That's not even mentioning the icing on the cake, that with their easy payment plans, you can get started on your dream property for as little as $200 per month. And there are no credit checks. I highly recommend that you head over to discountlots.com and check out what they have to offer. Those of you who are interested in purchasing something can use code DLTRIPPY10 for 10% off of your purchase at checkout. Thanks again to Discount lots for sponsoring today's video now let's get back to the action dad and i've been going around surveying the damage that's pretty much what you do when you're a farmer and it storms like this in the spring or fall looks like where we were originally north of mattoon about 15 miles north of here had a lot more rain than we did probably pushing inch and a half to two inches just checked the rain gauge at dad's only three tenths so far which is far from terrible there is another very strong line of storms coming here in the next 30 to 45 minutes and it hasn't stopped raining yet so I'd say the card's still on the table for a possible long-standing postponement from farming if we get an inch or two here. It's been a few hours and for the most part it does appear like the storms have subsided. We ended up with just over a half an inch of rain so 12 or 13 millimeters for you metric folk out there. 
All things considered, I know that I was daydreaming about planting yesterday and this morning, especially with the possibility of some tillage on the horizon. That didn't happen. I'm not gonna complain too much. We gotta be grateful we had less than an inch of rain, no tornadoes, no strong damaging winds, and no hail. So all things considered, I guess this was a victory because there were definitely areas that have not fared very well this week when it comes to big storms and damages from said storms. That's not even to mention the farmers in Minnesota, North Dakota, all that area that still have quite a bit of snow on the ground. So maybe I'm just not having the right perspective on this. Things will drive quickly. The 10 day forecast is pretty clear going to cool down for the next couple days and then around Easter on into the next week it's going to get warm again 70 to 75 no rain so we're definitely going to get some field work done unless we get some pop-up downpour at some point. I've had a lot of people tell me that I very well may have jinxed us by taking the planter to the field yesterday. I don't know if you believe in that type of stuff but the data is pretty evident if I had not taken it to the field maybe we could have done some tillage today. It's easier to get a planter to the field than it is to do any kind of tillage because what I did yesterday was not very invasive on the ground. I was only working on the top inch. Tillage, we're gonna be going anywhere from two, three, maybe even four inches. So it's a completely different scenario. I lied to you somewhat. There was one casualty in the storm. This old tree finally lost a big old limb. I don't think it was really that windy. So it must've just not been that structurally sound or starting to rot. It did have some blooms on it. Oh well, slowly but surely, another tree falls in the yard. Well, that's actually Katie's yard, so it's not really my problem. Although I'll probably end up having to break out the chainsaw and help. It's really hard to blame mother nature for issues that she causes. So we'll just pick the next best target. Let's blame the government. That tree falling, definitely their fault. <laughs> to back out of the shed when you don't have a trailer on the back. And I don't have to worry about getting in the mud. With the dryness we had going into today and a decent forecast moving forward, I would guesstimate that we'll probably not have any standing water by tomorrow midday. And then I would guess next Monday, probably at the earliest for dirt work. Here we are, Helena, north of Mattoon. Hmm, which of these trailers belong to the clean cut, nicely presented retailer? And which one belongs to the hodgepodge together farmer? Yeah, I'd say that's a pretty easy guess. I'd hop out real quick and lower it a little bit. Okay, I did get my instructional lesson real quick. Wouldn't have been worthwhile to film anyways because some of these farm places are very heavy on the curse words. I don't personally have any problem with that, but YouTube wouldn't like that, so. Oh well, we're headed home. They confirmed up there at Helena that they only had one inch of rain. You could have fooled me because there's water all across the countryside up here north of Mattoon. I'm just pulling back into the farm lot, so I'm gonna hop out and give you guys a real quick tour of our ultra fancy tendering trailer. I will apologize in advance because it does sound like it's fairly breezy out. Sometimes that cause audio issues. If it's so bad that you can't hear me, I'll add some captions. Probably shouldn't need it, but just so you know, I will do that. Before I walk around this trailer and you guys eat me alive in the comments, the first thing on my to-do list is to get the power washer out probably tomorrow and try to get the rest of this insulation taping off and shine this trailer up somewhat. You're only gonna be able to do so much without an actual polishing on it. A good high pressure washing should go a long way to getting a lot of this leftover material from removing the shell on the outside. There's a lot of technical terms for parts on this that I may kind of slaughter a little bit when I say, so forgive me or correct me in the comments. Everything is plumbed up with three inch lines except for the agitation tubes. I believe they use two inches. We've got our main valves coming out of each compartment of the tanker, just a two compartment tanker. Technically should be 3,400 gallons max capacity. Removing the bulkheads and cutting the other one into the baffle probably gained us 50 to 100 gallons. 
though 6,800 gallons on its own is overloaded, I doubt we'll see anything over 6,000 gallons, whatever the maximum legal load is, because we would never break the law knowingly. The main valves feed down into a four-way connection. The opposite side is the three-inch fill side. That's where we will hot load out of the retail location. They'll just hook up over there, and then they'll select what area they want to fill. This side that comes down here is the pressure side coming into our Honda engine and pump. I don't actually know the specifics about this pump. Looks pretty sturdy and it's what they recommended, though it was not cheap. I believe at full speed on the engine, this can pump somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 gallons per minute. I guess we'll have to time it once we get it hooked up to the Hagee. The pressure side of the pump, we have three options, two of which are agitations. They also color coded the valve handles for me. The green tank is matching with the valve on the back tank. Obviously, this is going to agitate the back tank. This is the front tank agitation, red to match the red main valve coming out of the bottom. Of course, we've also got our fill line that'll be going to our sprayer. They also did us the favor of plumbing in an air system to clean out our hose to the sprayer. This line right here feeds off of the trailer brake system. If the trailer brakes are released and pressurized, I can flip this open. It will blow out the remaining product into the sprayer tank. Once that has been evacuated through there, I'd go ahead and bleed this off and then unattach that after I've turned the valve off on the sprayer side and we'll have a much lighter hose. They recommended that mostly just for logistical reasons. They said that these long hoses, which is probably 25 foot or so, are much easier to deal with if they're not full of chemical. The welding shop installed threads on the top and bottom of each compartment for a side glass. Helena put some tubes on us, so we got a side glass here and then a side glass over there. That's just to visualize the level of product in the tank. Unless I measure how much water is at each level, I won't really have a quantifiable amount for each level, but I'll know when I'm running low. And I can probably guesstimate based on the level how much is in the tank. Everything I just showed you was on the passenger side because we're making the assumption that most of the time you're going to be parked on the correct side of the road to load your sprayer. On the driver's side is where that big three inch fill is. It's got one of those fancy high flow valves with the safety stops on it. And then you can see this is the side that the agitation plumbing comes to. Backside runs along here, hops up into that back tank. Front side does the same. It doesn't look like it has to travel quite as far and it goes right up in there. Agitation is a very necessary requirement for a tanker like this. If you have a lot of chemicals sitting in here and the load get mixed or moved around frequently in transit, the products can settle out of that solution. Most of the time, if you're just going, picking up your load and loading immediately out into your sprayer, it's not going to be an issue. Some products in particular are a little bit more troublesome for settling. The issue is that if your products settle out of solution, you get it in different quantities throughout your tank. You may find yourself on one load having a much hotter load of chemical because your pump ended up pulling more product or actual chemical in the water mixture and you could hurt your crops. Or the opposite could happen. You could have a load that isn't potent enough because you pulled mostly water out and all of your product is still sitting in the tank, probably leading back to the first issue. Either way, you want to make sure that you have an ability to properly mix your load. That is especially pertinent if you're going to be letting it sit for a long time. A lot of times people pull these tankers, they're spraying all day, they're moving through their chemical quickly, so settling isn't as much of a concern. I may be parking this for extended amounts of time in the spring while I'm trying to do planning and then get out and spray residual products behind our soybeans. So agitation is definitely key. You can do a very minor amount of agitation by just taking the truck around the block. If you want to be thorough about it, you need a good agitation system. I'm about to show you what Helena has done for me on this tanker. I think it's the best simple solution, though if you wanted it done properly on something of this size, you really need what they call a sparge tube, which runs underneath both sides of the tank with a pressure line through it and a bunch of small holes pointed against the tank itself. Essentially, this jetting force of liquid going back through allows the load to roll and that rolling of the load thoroughly mixes it. I'm gonna hop up here real quick, again, apologize for the wind, and show you what they've done as the best case scenario in the short term for this trailer. This actually had some fancy vacuum pressure deal on it. They replaced it with just a simple couple of elbows to allow any kind of air to come in to prevent a vacuum compression of the tanker, which is pretty impressive to see, though you'd be very disappointed if it happened to yours. 
And then here on the back, they plumbed in that two inch agitation line. We'll pop open this cover real quick and I'll show you what we're working with in there. I do have to give them credit because they went beyond the standard Call of Duty. They didn't just straight pipe the agitation line in there. They put an elbow, had a little bit of a drop, and then flattened the end of this tube to create a fan-like agitation at very high pressures that should help somewhat simulate a rolling of the load. Obviously not going to be as good as a legitimate sparge tube, though it should be pretty good for mixing, especially if you give it plenty of time. Just to rehash the whole baffle situation, there's the baffle in the middle there that the welders cut. They did a great job. That obviously was a different project than plumbing. Just wanted to show you guys that again. One thing they did warn me of, and I need to keep an eye on as we go through the season, is that this simpler type of agitation system is much more prone to foaming than a sparge tube because it is going to be throwing the liquid on top of the other liquid as opposed to mixing underneath. If you get a lot of foaming, you have to put defoaming products in. Something to keep an eye on. Most of the time won't be an issue. It just completely depends on what kind of chemicals you got in the tank. One last point I'd like to make is that it was very important to run the agitation tube to the back side of the compartment. If it had just been ran right on top of where the drain was, we would have probably just been continuously mixing the same area. Since it's pushing it all the way to the back and behind the baffle, we should get a lot of stirring back there and throughout the entire compartment as we're also pulling some out of the bottom here, resulting in a fairly good mix, especially if we let this pump run at even half throttle for a couple of minutes. At two or 300 gallons per minute, you're going to stir this load pretty aggressively, especially if it's not fully loaded. The first time when it's fully loaded, most of the time, you're probably going straight to the sprayer anyways. I know I said a lot there. I'm not gonna pretend to be an expert. I could have never in a million years plumbed this as nicely as they did. They've done a lot more of these than I have. They are in the business of handling chemicals, so it would make sense that they're more knowledgeable. I should also mention that this is mutually beneficial for them and us. It is in their best interest to make this thing as streamlined as possible for filling hot loads this spring and summer. And obviously they want us to have something we're satisfied with and have a good representation of their company. And so far we're pretty happy with what we're working with. I would really love to hear your feedback, what you think on this setup. I know there's things that could probably be improved. It's our first trailer. Maybe after we run it for a few seasons and decide we want to do something else, we'll go that route. Some of you have commented that it's surprising that we have a tanker and we're getting hot loads versus having a legitimate tender trailer with water and mixing your own product straight into the sprayer. I'll just be honest with you, a lot of guys in this area are not doing a setup like that. They're hot loading. It takes less time. It takes less manpower. You just need one qualified person driving a truck. They don't have to worry about mixing and you don't have to worry about mixing into the sprayer. So like I said, drop comments down below, leave feedback. I'll get back to you whenever I can. Alrighty, we've discussed the thing today that is going well for us. Now we'll discuss something that's been giving us problems this new 2230 FH fuel cultivator. Well, I was out in the much drier conditions yesterday getting everything dialed in on the new DB60 planter. My dad drugged this 2230 out of the barn, hooked it up to this 9460R, which theoretically will be pulling it this year. And we've discovered that it's not wanting to unfold. I've been working periodically between rainfall today, trying to diagnose what's wrong with this. I haven't gotten very far and I'll fill you in on what I've learned. I don't think I really need to give you guys a refresher course on this fuel cultivator. We ordered it two falls ago and it didn't show up till last July. It was supposed to be in in February, then March, then April, then May, then June, then July. You get the idea. We didn't end up bringing it home until last December. Obviously still brand new. Like I said, 2230 FH fuel cultivator, 52 and a half foot, fully equipped with the true set tillage system which leads me to my next issue. We can't get it to unfold. As the next generation of this farm, I made the obvious generalization that my dad must have hooked it up wrong, because that's typically what you think when it comes to something like this, especially involving this much technology. I verified everything, I messed around with everything. No, there was no issues, he did it right, much to my surprise. I searched all over the field cultivator. There was only one control valve, and it was that one, and it was on. So that wasn't an issue. Let me just hop up in the cab and show you the peculiar nature of this problem. Fire the old 9460R up. 
great question going into this season is whether or not 460 horsepower is enough to pull a 52 foot field culminator. I guess we'll find out shortly. I won't bore you with the whole true set spiel. Basically, it has a bunch of sensors all over that allow you to dial everything in from the monitor. You don't have to go back out and make single point adjustments. You just hit buttons on your display and set the height, set the depth of everything, the down pressure, down force, all of it from the cap. It's supposed to be easy to operate, nearly flawless, and the best thing since sliced bread, supposedly. I will also say that this fuel cultivator right here is substantially newer than the one we traded in. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. We came from a 2210 field cultivator. I believe that this thing is 16 or 17 years newer. I mean, it looks brand new because it is. Paints a lot fresher and it's got all that technology. The interesting catch about this is, is that you cannot unfold this field cultivator unless everything's hooked up because it is a dynamic unfolding process. I'll try and show you what I mean by dynamic. The only thing on this field cultivator that can be done without everything hooked up is raising and lowering the field cultivator. Even then, you want to be careful doing this because you can actually push the wheels into each other if it's not programmed correctly or if it's out of phase or communication, which I think is the issue we're having. Now watch, I'm going to hit the second lever, which is unfold for us. This should unfold the wings and at the same time, do the dynamic part of the process, which is adjust the wing wheels so they don't hit each other. Right now it should be unfolding. The only thing that's happening is that the wheels are pulling up. That is supposed to occur. The wing wheels pull up so they don't hit each other on the unfold process. I want you to look at this. I am moving the second hydraulic lever. You can also see that there is hydraulic lines jolting on the back of the tractor there on the tongue of the field cultivator meaning that there is pressure being delivered and the lines are not unhooked. Yet the field cultivator is not unfolding, which is baffling to me because there's very obviously pressure being delivered to the lines. The fold cylinders are quite literally lit. They're not even trying to move. If they were hung up or pinned up or something, you would at least see them working against something. The wings are not moving. The cylinders have not moved. They're not even leaving that folding groove. The area I'm talking about is right where the ram ends. See, there's that little groove. When it's in the down position, that's from pulling the wing in and up. When it goes to unfold, it pushes to the top of that groove and pushes outward. You can see, trying to unfold right now, nothing is happening. Wing wheels are moving, cylinder is dormant. This whole predicament is why I mentioned at the beginning that everything is plugged in, aligned correctly, can't figure out why it's not working. Everything is moving like it knows it's supposed to be unfolding, but it's not unfolding. I've walked around this field cultivator numerous times. It's not pinned up. I can't find any control valves anywhere. There's quite literally nothing other than a ton of hydraulic lines and even more sensors on it. My dad and I have already made multiple trips to the John Deere dealership. Don't worry, it's literally just on the way to town, so it's not that far out of our way, and he stops in there a lot anyways. Two of the salesmen came out and inspected it. They couldn't get it to unfold, which only verifies our problem. At this point, it's escalated to sending a service technician out to figure out what's wrong with it. That is the problem with these true set systems. I really like them. They're awesome to operate, especially if you're a big tech guy like myself. There's just so much going on on this that it's hard to truly diagnose where the main issue is. They said that the software could be outdated or needs updated. Could you imagine that you need a software update to unfold your field cultivator and you don't even have the ability to get said software yourself? Kind of ridiculous if you ask me. Could be that something was not installed correctly, one of the sensors. Not blaming anyone for that, but there's a lot to get aligned on this that can cause issues like that. Really makes you question the validity and long-term potential and reliability of these systems on your farm. Very convenient, but at what cost? TrueSet has not really been around long enough to see what these things are going to do in the long term. I think the oldest TrueSet stuff is maybe five years old at this point, maybe six or seven, I don't know. I'd be interested to see how it holds up in 30 years. I should be completely fair and say that this could be our problem. We may have messed something up when we hooked it up or something. Either way, seems a little bit 
bit unnecessary to have to have a service call to get your fuel cultivator on full. No worries though, with the rain, it's gonna be a slow couple of days here, so I'll check back in with you guys tomorrow. The cold weather's moved back into the area this morning, so I had to break the mess back out. I thought it was retired since it didn't. 35 degrees feels a lot colder after it was just in the 80s the other day than it did after it was in the zeros months ago. It's funny how relative temperature feels based on what you have recently experienced. Anyways, I'm just getting back to the farm this morning. I took the semi and tanker trailer down to get safety tested. It passed with flying colors, much to my surprise. So we're good to rock and roll other than power washing this off and maybe doing an additional leak test on the tanks. Chris and Jeff are back to hauling corn. Looks like the fuel cultivator has been moved and it's right in the way of where I need to go. Uh, maybe I can squeeze it in in the mud right there to the north of that tractor. I tried, but I'm not going to be able to facilitate that without making too much of a mess. And Jeff showed back up to start loading corn, so it got a little complicated. I'm just going to go ahead and move this 9460R and field cultivator out of the way. It doesn't look like there's any reason this can't be just pushed back a little bit over to the southwest. I'm gonna hop in it real quick and just pull it over. You gotta be careful where you park things around here. The wash bay is prime real estate. You block it with something like a tractor, then it makes it hard to wash other things. Before I dive into shining up that tanker trailer, I wanted to give you a quick update on the 2230 and the unfolding situation. A mechanic stopped by first thing this morning while I was down getting that truck and trailer tested. He diagnosed the issue, determined that it had nothing to do with software. It was all because the seven pin connector on the field cultivator had a little bit of dirt or debris in it. At least that's what my dad relayed back to me. The seven pin is really your standard electrical connection, runs your flashers and auxiliary power. The ISO is the computer connection, so that's the data transfer line. I would have thought that it would have been the ISO that was dirty, not the seven pin, but I do believe the seven pin is responsible for powering the TrueSet system. Obviously, that is a relatively simple fix. I guess we know now to look for that, but it is still pretty impressive that a seven pin connector not being clean enough would be enough to completely prevent your field cultivator from unfolding. I know I said a mouthful yesterday about this field cultivator and different considerations with long-term reliability, and I still stand by all that. It is something that a simple electrical issue could completely prevent your field cultivator from unfolding. Imagine the nightmare that something like this would be if a mouse got into the wiring somewhere. And there is a lot of connections across this implement. If you had some mishap like that on a system like this, you'd be opening up Pandora's box for long-term electrical diagnostic issues. Anyways, long story short, it wasn't the software like they initially expected. It was just an electrical connection issue. Still silly that that's even possible. It should be able to unfold, in my opinion, without any kind of electrical stuff hooked up. But that was the scenario we were dealing with. I will say that is surprising that that was the fix because it was registering everything on the 2630. The true set information was getting sent to the tractor. It knew what was going on. That is kind of confusing or counterintuitive that that little hiccup could still limit it from unfolding when it was already communicating information, which basically means it was powered. I really don't know. Like I said, this is secondhand information from my dad. Chris and Jeff are still working on this bin. If they keep up this pace, we very well may be having it swept out before we start planning. Today is Thursday, Easter's this Sunday, and quite frankly, I'm expecting with this cooler weather, the earliest we could possibly do any field work is Monday. More realistically, probably Tuesday or Wednesday for a big head start on planning. Alrighty, just got the tanker backed into the wash bay. Chris and Jeff about got their truck loaded. I'm gonna drag the power washer down here and see if I can get the rest of this insulation tape off. I'm not sure if this was even remotely necessary. I put a little tarp over the engine on the pump and engine assembly. I'll probably do that if I leave this trailer outside. It just seems like good practice to keep water out of that if possible. Like I said, probably not do or die. I'm sure it wouldn't really affect the lifespan of the engine too much, but 
we've got a significant amount of money tied up in this system right now so we're just going to take care of it and boy oh boy do i mean significant this is way over budget already got about 34 ish thousand dollars in the tanker itself got close to thirteen thousand dollars in the de-skinning the removal of the bulkheads and cutting the baffles and on top of that that thirteen thousand also includes the plumbing pump engine valves all of that i mean quite a bit more expensive than i was realizing it was going to be so we've got let's say forty six forty seven thousand dollars in this combo right here not including licensing which although a pain in the rear end to pay isn't as significant as the hardware itself so we are officially over budget that shouldn't come as a surprise to any of you because i don't know any individuals in any industry right now who are coming in under budget on any of their projects everything is way overpriced compared to what it used to be and then some so no matter what you do you're probably going to pay more than you're wanting to I've been washing on this thing for close to two hours. I am soaking wet right now, especially from washing up top. At least the sun came out because this would have been miserably cold to do if it was 30 degrees all day, like it was this morning. Anyways, I am probably not gonna be able to get it any better than this. A lot of the insulation tape came off. The residue did not. I think if we had a heated power washer, it probably would have helped my case, though I think this will need a legitimate polishing if it wants to look fresh and new. I'm not sure if I'm feeling up to that challenge this spring. On a completely unrelated note, we've just opened up an internship spot here at Dole Farms for spring and summer. Uh, your first job is going to be polishing this tanker. Like I said, not related at all, but there's that opportunity if you're looking for something very fun, enjoyable, and exciting to do. While this dries off, I'm gonna run home, eat lunch. I may actually take our garden hose here that's been running the power washer, throw it up in one of these tanks and start filling it. I could probably start that, fall asleep, and wake up a week from now and it wouldn't be full. It'll be interesting to see how much water I get over the lunch break period. I've got the hose filling the back compartment. Theoretically, if I open the back valve and the fill valve, should be enough head pressure on that to put the water out this way. So let's give that a shot. So that's the fill valve. That's the... Yep. Okay, just got back from lunch. It's been right at an hour. Any guesses how full our 7,000 gallon tanker is? I'm willing to bet very minimally. We are maybe a foot and a half up the sight gauge right there. So we have more to fill in this tank than we filled by far because the bulk of your storage is probably actually in that third to two thirds range. The bottom foot and a half or two foot is still part of that slope so it's actually not as much as if it was in the middle or up high this right here is part of the reason that we are not mixing our own chemical here at the farm other than just not wanting to handle it ourselves we do not have the water capacity or storage setup to fill this if we had some kind of a nurse tank or i had the wild idea to somehow line one of these harvestors to hold water we could actually fill this relatively quickly with a big pump like we have on the bottom of the tanker but that's not the way we're set up for this first year or so we're going to kind of see how the hot loads work out we are also only using a regular size garden hose off of a one inch spigot that i believe is teed off of a two inch water line coming off our well our well could fill this pretty fast if we had the direct plumbing set up for it, which we don't. I've repeated that a million times now, but I am going to take this tanker over to our local water cooperative, their treatment plant, and directly fill out of their place so I can actually put a load test on this and do some training with the system. to my dad to remove that tree in the sketchiest way possible put the prongs on the loader tractor and it just picked it up 
and took that wide load down the road. He only had to go a quarter of a mile, but the principle remains true. Probably not the safest way to move a tree when there's traffic. I guess this isn't his first rodeo. The good news is that we don't have to go far at all to get to the water plant. That is literally it right over there. As a matter of fact, the water they treat actually comes off of one of our farms. They've got three big well houses on our field. That's the one we set the plant around the other day. We're gonna go steal some of their water. And by steal, I mean pay for some of their water. Okay, we're just down the road, maybe a mile east of our farm. It's really, literally a stone's throw away at the water treatment plant. I'm gonna load bulk in here. They said even with the capacity they have, it still may take a while, but surely it'll be faster than the well. I hopped up there, guided the spout into the front of my back compartment, and now they gave me this override key to run. It's kind of an honor system here. There's no gauge or anything. Basically, you say, well, I think I did 5,000 gallons, so they send you a bill for 5,000 gallons. Or you could say, well, yeah, we only put 1,000 gallons in, when in reality you did 5,000. That'd be a good way to save money. It sounds like it's running. I think. Yeah, that's a little faster than the old garden house. This won't even be close though to Helena where we're going to be hot loading out of. They said that they can fill at over 700 gallons per minute. That is a lot of liquid. This is maybe a inch and a half or two inch hose running full speed. That'll be a three inch hose with a lot of pressure behind it. I kind of want to try my little experiment I was talking about earlier in the video. The front tank is completely empty. I'm going to hop down and flip both valves open and see if we get an equilibrium forming where the front tank starts to fill up as well. Before I do it, here's the back sight glass and there's the front sight glass, no liquid in it. All right, dump the first valve, then dump the second valve. Would you look at that? Physics in action. Water starting to pile up on the front. We're not getting any more water. It's not coming out of the spout faster. It's just dispersing the weight to the other side of the tank. Just a natural thing that water does and really any liquid when presented with a situation like that. This same principle is actually what allows these sight glasses to work. Even though they're technically separated from the middle area of the tank, the pressure in the tank itself equalizes the water on the outside. This is inside that front tank right above that valve. You can see the water bubbling out of there. If you peek right through the trees there, you can see our grain bins. That's just where we were cleaning this. We actually farm all this in this field as well. So it's kind of like we're right next to home. I've been here for roughly 40 or 45 minutes now. Keep in mind that I did start with a couple hundred gallons in the tank. Most of what's in here though is probably from this fill right now. I'm gonna be honest, for what I'm doing, I don't know if I have the patience to sit here till it's full. I'd say we're a little under half, so maybe 3,000 gallons of water in here. I'm gonna shut all this down, close the hatches, and take this around the block and see how it rides and check to make sure there's no leaks. I wanna be fair, so how much water should we tell them we took? What, 150, 200 gallons? Uh, I'll round up. That's more like 250 or 300. We'll do 300. That's definitely more fair. I'm just teasing. We're a lot of things, but liars is not one of them. Wish me luck, everyone. I've never hauled anything that is liquid, especially of such substantial volume. So I'm gonna take my time, I'm gonna go around the block and just kind of feel what the load is like. I've got the baffles in there, so it should slow down any kind of weight transfer, making it less of an issue. I am going to tiptoe my way into this one just to kind of feel out the waters, no pun intended. I'll see you later, Clearwater. Thanks for the 300 gallons of water. For simple math, let's say we have 3,000 gallons of water in here. That is a net load weight of over 24,000 pounds, much less than we'd haul with, say, corn in a grain trailer. It's the shifting of the load, though, that presents the security issue. This is my second corner I've taken with this load. It's really not that bad. Of course, I'm not completely loaded. They say that fully loaded is the best, other than empty, because there's less room for the liquid to move. Anywhere from half to two thirds is where the weight really starts shifting back and forth. For me, so far, it's just felt like I'm riding on a boat. 
Does it feel like it's going to take control of me at any time or push me through any stop signs? But I have a very limited sample size so far. Hey, there's those water wells I was just talking about. That's where the water in our tanker just came from. Except for it had to make its way over to the water plant. Okay, made it around the block with no issue. There's definitely going to be some adjustments made in driving because it does handle the load differently, especially with how the truck pulls against it as the weight comes forward and backward. It's almost confusing our automatic transmissions a little bit. No big deal. I'm gonna back it in here and we're gonna play around with the pumps. Everything up until this point in the video we will refer to as the boring part because we are now getting to the fun part. I'm gonna fire up the engine and pump and kind of show you guys around. This will allow me to both demonstrate to you all how this all works and give myself a little bit of self-discovery because I've never ran something like this. Disclaimer before I started anything here, this is all clean water I'm about to dump on the ground. So don't worry, there's nothing contaminated in here. I'm just doing this for testing purposes, not polluting what's behind us. There's two things you wanna do before you even start your pump up and that is turn on your valves. You obviously want to turn on your valve on the side that is going to be supplying the product. And then the instructor in my very short crash course on operating this said at the bare minimum, you always want to make sure or at least do your best to make sure that your pump is not putting pressure against closed valves, that it has somewhere to send the liquid. For this case, I'm going to turn the agitation valve on the back compartment because I opened the back valve. This is the back agitation valve. So when I fire this pump up, it's going to be pumping right away. You don't have to worry about any back pressure building up because the pump can immediately put liquid up into the agitation valve. I'm going to fire this up and then climb up there and show you guys how much churning it's doing. Pretty straightforward system here. We've got a Honda GX390 engine here running this pump. Those of you who work outdoors know that you can never go wrong with a Honda engine. They seem to be super reliable. And this has got an electric start. It's running at pretty close to idle. I don't know if you could idle it without killing the engine. We'll hop up here and see what's going on. That's not too shabby. And we're running at idle, like I said. I'm gonna climb back down. We're gonna open it up wide open and see what it does. Well, it was going at a pretty good pace. I mean, I must have ran out of fuel or something. That's about half throttle right there. You'll probably never really agitate wide open. Like I said earlier in the video, you could get a lot of foaming if you do this too much. It's mixing in the back here and pulling from that valve in the front, meaning that we're getting good disbursement of the solution and hopefully mixing everything back up if it's settled. Obviously, that's neat and all and extremely important. I'm sure I said that a time or two in the video already. Let's go to the main event, which is the three inch fill line that'll go straight into the sprayer. Here's the fill line. Got your standard locking cap on it. Try to put this somewhere where it doesn't leave a massive gully in the yard because I do know it's gonna move a lot of water. Pretty simple stuff. I'm going to flip the valve that's on the fill side of the pump. Once that valve's open, the water can go both ways. And then I'm going to close the agitation line. Right when I did that, I can hear the water moving out the three inch line. That right there is the idle fill speed. So I don't know what that calculates out to. A good amount of water. It'd take a long time though to fill the 1200 gallon spray tank with that. I'm gonna go speed the engine up to full throttle. I'll leave you guys here and let you see the difference. I knew that was gonna happen. speaking let's say our sprayer is about full at this point what we're going to do is probably slow down the engine a little bit to reduce the flow through the line secondary thing we want to do to be ready to shut off is crack our agitation valve that will reduce our flow somewhat the main purpose though is to have somewhere for this water to go when we do shut off the main three inch valve. Once I shut that off, there's not going to be very much water left in there. For the last part of this demonstration, I do need air to the trailer brakes. So I'm probably gonna have to start the truck back up. Last part, 
Let's assume you're still hooked up to the sprayer. You filled it about where you want it. Now you use the airline that is plumbed off the trailer brakes, which is why I turned that on. You flip the valve and that pressure will clean this line out. If you wanted to be technical, you could leave all of the valves in use open. I would not advise leaving the fill side open. That just seems like too much of a risk. The main valve out of the compartment, the agitation valve, I don't see why you couldn't leave them open. It just isn't probably sound practice, especially going down the road. If you clip one of these hoses or one comes loose, you've got a lot of product in this tank that would cost a lot of money to replace and clean up that could possibly spill out. I don't think these valves are gonna be something that fail on you. So if you're leaving the field and going somewhere else, it's probably wise just to take a couple extra steps, reach over there and close your valves. It's not like it's extremely challenging. Just like that, it's closed up. It's not going anywhere. I would really enjoy one of those hose reels that winds up. They're a fairly expensive option. And like I said, we're already over budget. We'll see how this treats us this spring. If we feel like it's worth the money to go to one of those expensive powered hose reels for three inch line, I think it can go up to 75 foot maybe. I don't know, could be crazy. Mounted in here somewhere. It would be nice from a convenience standpoint, though having an air purge line reduces that weight enough that it's probably not necessary to even have it self-powered. That's pretty much it for my demonstration of our real high-tech fancy tender tanker trailer. I said earlier in the video, leave me some comments below. Give me your feedback. I'd like to know what you guys are using on your farm or things on our tender that could improve our lives other than a legitimate sparge tube. I've already talked about that because it is supposed to cool off a little bit and it seems to have passed my leak test. I'm going to go ahead and dump both main valves and open the fill valve and let this water all run out. The entire purpose of filling this up was just so I could show you and myself how to work it. That way, when we hit the ground running this spring, I'm not running around like a chicken with his head cut off that's clueless about the technology he's running. Let's see how far this is going to shoot out. Not very far actually. I thought it was going to go farther than that. I'm going to leave this trailer unattended. I don't think anything can really go wrong with draining as long as I remember to close all the valves before we go to fill. The engine probably has cooled off a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and throw that tarp over it just to be safe. Like I said, we've got a lot of money invested in this setup. We'll make sure it lasts for a handful of years. An engine and a pump like that, and probably more specifically the pump, aren't going to last forever. They said that if we get five or six years out of it, that's a pretty good run. Alrighty, folks, I'm sure this video is way too long already. Not going to roll it into another day, and we've got all sorts of excitement here around the corner. Planning season and field work should begin very shortly. As always, everyone, I greatly appreciate you continuing to tune in and support the channel. Your viewership means the world to me. I'll catch you all in the next episode. Until then, make sure you like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you want to see more, and comment down below if you have any questions. You know I love to talk about farming. Have a great day, everyone. Peace.